Bien, buenos días. Uh, estoy muy emocionado de retornar a Medellín, la ciudad muy bonita, y a uh, ScaleConf. Muchas gracias por invitarme. Um, ¿Para quién es su primera vez en ScaleConf? Ah, muy bien, bienvenidos. ¿Y segunda vez? Chévere, muy bien. Vale, um, the rest of the talk will be in English. <laughs> So today we'll talk about zero downtime migrations at scale. I have been fortunate to lead and be part of several zero downtime migrations, so I'm very excited to share with you my experiences and some of the main takeaways so that you can be successful in your migrations. Before we start, how many of you have done migrations? Okay, great, that's a big number. How many of you We'll be, are doing migrations right now, we'll be doing migrations soon and considering it. Okay, and then for the rest of you, just consider this as a thought experiment exercise. Come with me for the ride to think about what kinds of considerations we need to have in order to have a successful migration. Migrations tend to be incredibly hard, incredibly expensive, and so perhaps you'll go back and look at this for those of you who are not doing it anytime soon. I'm Isolo Greenberg. I'm a senior software engineer at Google, and I currently work on drive infrastructure. Throughout my career at Google, I've worked on a number of infrastructure projects, such as search infrastructure, like for Google.com, for search engine, and uh, on developer infrastructure, for uh, building developer tools. And one of the examples we'll look at today is actually from my experience leading zero downtime migration for the distributed build system. We're not going to discuss it in too much detail. Last year I talked a little bit about it. Um, there's a lot more talks that I've given about the distributed system itself, uh, the distributed build system itself. Uh, if you're curious, you can check them out and I can let you know about the best talks depending on your interests. And I'm really excited to share with you for the first time the project, the migration I've been working on for the past year and a half. And so a lot of this talk will be about that. And I'm online on Twitter, and so you can find me if you have any questions. So zero downtime migrations. Let's, this is a pretty complicated topic, so let's break it down one by one. So first, let's talk about migrations in general. When do we start considering migrations? It's usually when we've had a system that was running well, that uh, acquires customers because it was very successful, and at some point, we start hearing other scaling limitations, or we come across a better suitable database that we should migrate the data to. Something changes where our system has already existed for a while, and now we need to improve it. Maybe we found out that certain use cases are a lot more important than others in the system, and so we need to migrate our system. There's generally, the way I think about it is there's two types of migrations. One is a data migration, where you move it from old data storage to the new one. And another one is architectural migration. So let's talk about data migrations. So you have your old data storage, old database, and you have your new data storage. So now you need to copy the data from old to the new. And then in order to prove that the data will still appear the same to the user, you'll do some sort of parity verification where you'll confirm that you'll serve from the new database data that looks very similar, it, it looks the same to the user as from the old database. And maybe after the migration is completed and successful, you'll start making modifications to the front end. Now, architectural migrations, the most common one that I've seen the past several years is uh, usually migrating to microservices. So we've had a lot of talks today about microservices and yesterday as well. So um, the one that I led was uh, to move our um, build rabbit system, which is a distributed build system, where we had one client for the user, and then it would talk to the scheduler, and a scheduler basically acted as a load balancer. It would tell which of the workers has the capacity to execute the work. And so the client will find out which worker should talk to, and then um, talk to the worker, and uh, the worker will start sending its outputs. What are the outputs in a distributed build system or any build system? Well, it's usually the artifact. It's the binaries that the build system has built. And it's also maybe pro build progress information. For instance, if you're running 100 tests and you're interested in which ones are still failing after you fix some bug, then you might rerun them all to make sure that you haven't broken the rest of them. And then maybe you will stop as soon as you find out that some of the tests are still breaking. 
Um, throughout this whole talk, the arrows will be about the data flowing from the system, so I'll uh, continue pointing it out to make it clearer. So now, um, the, w the architecture that we migrated it to is we still had the same client for the user, but then we replaced the scheduler with the persistent queue. So now it's just a matter of the user putting the data onto the persistent queue, and then when the worker had capacity, it would just pull the work off of the queue. And so now it produced two types of results, as I mentioned. So it produced binaries, build artifacts, and build progress information. So it would output them into their own services. And now the user had the choice of retrieving either of those, both of those, neither of those. So if it needed the binaries, it would query for the results of the binaries. If you're running the tests, um, a ton of tests, then maybe you're not really interested in the binaries that are built, but you're interested in their progress information. So now the user had the choice. And so we moved from the single server plus the load balance architecture towards the uh, service uh, architecture. So we talked about uh, the different types of migrations. Let's discuss what zero downtime migration means. And before we jump into that, I just want to note that not every migration needs to be zero downtime. Perhaps some of you have done migrations where you just turned off the system and turned it back on, yes? Okay, I see a few nods and hands, yes, great. So that is a perfectly reasonable of migrating the system. For instance, uh, you might have seen something like we'll be kind of performing a schedule maintenance at some point uh, during the hours where customers are least expected to use it. For instance, if I have a local e-commerce site where I'm so selling local goods, and I expect that none of my customers will be shopping at 3 in the morning till 4 in the morning on a Monday because they will either be getting ready for work or be sleeping still, so that's a perfectly reasonable time for me to turn down the system run the upgrade, migrate it, and then turn it back on. And pretty much no user will be inconvenienced, and that is perfectly fine. Most users won't even notice, won't even know. And those who do, they'll just have to come back, and it's not a big deal. Now, unfortunately, not in all systems, luxury of downtime is an option. For the systems that I've worked on, we have users in every single time zone all around the globe, and so that means that we can't really have the downtime because there's always someone that is going to use the services, the systems that I'm uh, maintaining and providing. And so what that means is that we need to figure out a way to migrate without affecting any of the users. Um, this is also complicated by some facts where we might have automated processes that are scheduled to run at different times. For instance, you might have your deployment infrastructure that kicks off and deploys nightly to one of your environments. That would need to talk to the distributed build system and kick it off. So now that we discussed zero downtime, let's talk about scale, which makes it even harder. So, uh, specifically, let's talk about scale on the project that I've been working on for the past year and a half that I'm excited to share with you. Uh, it's specifically zero downtime migration for backups. We then drive infrastructure, we store some backups, it actually ended up being a new architecture and a new data storage migration. So what does it, so how many of you are familiar with the drive? Project, yes, okay, or almost all of you, perfect. So um, it's the service that stores you. Google Docs, Google Slides, all of that um, in Drive, as well as other data. So now, um, what does it mean to do migration at scale for backups from Drive? Well, so first of all, we have hundreds of millions of users that are pretty much in every country, and with over one billion of backups representing over one trillion of objects. So that's a lot of data that we need to move. And they're in every single country, so that means that they'll be accessing their data, expecting it to be there any time. Um, the important consideration here was that there was no sharing. When you back up your data, it's just, you know, it's just a bundle. You don't really share your backups with the family, right? You just put them on there, and you hope they're there when you need them. And examples of those are like Android device backups. Um, messaging clients might want to back up the data. There's no search, you, we just treat backups as bundle of data. We don't really need to search it the same way we need to search for our Google Docs to figure out which of the particular documents we need to access at some point. And there's no folders, we just treat backups as one bundle of data. Now, important, interesting thing about backup traffic is that it's mainly write traffic, and so 
that means that users will be writing, for instance, I back up nightly, and so nightly there will be a, a lot of traffic coming through uh, from my user, and, um, but sometimes backups might fail, um, and re-traffic is the most important one. Re-traffic happens when we're actually restoring the data, right? And when you're restoring your device, it's very important that it succeeds because otherwise you lost the data and you don't know how to recover that data. And so it's very important that re-traffic is prioritized the highest possible. And uh, another interesting thing, another interesting uh, con consideration was Spanner. So Spanner provides global uh, strong consistency, which was perfect for our use case because we have global users all around the globe, and we wanted to provide them strong consistency and guarantees. And another nice thing about Spanner, uh, among many others, is that it provides a SQL-like query language. So that meant that our developers on the team didn't have to learn a whole new query language, which might sometimes be very confusing. And so we could start developing right off the bat, and that was convenient, and it was pretty intuitive for the team to start maintaining it. Now, if uh, those of you who were in Vida his talk yesterday, she mentioned atomic clocks. And so I highly recommend you read the paper. I'm not going to cover it today, but Spanner uses atomic clocks in a very interesting manner to keep track of time as uh, accurately as possible. So check Vida his talk out first and then read the uh, Spanner paper. Mm -hmm. And so now the last important consideration is the backups can get very large. I have two cats, and I love my cats, and I'd be very upset if m some of my cat pictures were uh, lost somehow. And so I'm going to be taking lots of pictures of them, storing them on my phone, and then hoping that when I switch phones that I'll have all my cat pictures on my device. So how do you migrate all of this data from the, new data, uh, from the old data storage to the new uh, and to the new architecture? Well, this is a big copy-paste job, right, that we we'll have to run <laughs> for all those backups. So let's, uh, for the rest of the talk, we'll talk about the, how we dealt with doing zero downtime migration for backups. And specifically, I'll talk about the data migration and the architecture migration, kind of like comparing the uh, concerns of it side by side. And then at the end of the talk, I'll go over some common considerations that, that you might want to think about when starting your migration, because every migration is going to be different. I've done several of them at this point, and they were all different, but some of the common considerations hold from one to the other. And so hopefully, um, even if your migration is not going to look like mine, then you can uh, take something useful out for your own work. So first of all, uh, we know that we need to copy a ton of data, right? We need to copy-paste from old data storage to the new. And so we start doing dual writes because we want to get all new data and minimum amount of copying that we need to do. That's a lot of data, as you saw, for our scale. And so we'll start dual writing. And this allows us to start getting all the new data in and so that we can minimize the amount of copying we'll have to do later. And the important consideration here is, are we storing all the data correctly? Sometimes converting it from one schema to another is not trivial, and so understanding which parts of the data are necessary and which parts were there just because of the other historical context of it is very important. And so ensuring that we store all the important bits on the metadata, that we're storing all the bytes of the data correctly before we proceed on the migration was a very important consideration at this stage. So now for architectural migration also, dual writes allow us to prove the new stack. And so we can have the new stack up and running to start accepting the dual writes and start testing our system, ensuring that the architecture is able to support the load, that we understand how the writes will be served back up, but for now just doing the um, writes, no read. And so important consideration here is there should be no effect on latency. So we should do the write in a best effort manner uh, asynchronously. So as soon as the request completes to the old system, we'll just return the result to the user right away so that they don't see the effect of running this dual write. But then also we want to make sure that there's no effect on error rate. So if the old system fails, then we just return it to that to the user. If it succeeded in the old system, then we'll write it to the new system and ensure that um, the user sees no impact whatsoever from these writes. 
because for now we still haven't verified that our system is stable, that we can trust it, and so this is very early stages. So now that we started dual writing all the newly arriving data, we need to start backfilling data. And so that means that we need to migrate all of the um, data that is not being actively written um, from the old system to the new system. And there's a few important considerations. One of them is, do we understand all the client behavior and adapt the data correctly? One of the important things when doing backups from mobile devices is that connectivity is a big problem. So if you fall out of the Wi-Fi zone, all of a sudden, you only have completed partial backup, right? Somehow, like, the network went away. And so that means that you have to be able to interpret when your migration process comes in, you have to be able to interpret what does it mean to see a partial backed up state. Because the next night, or as soon as my Wi-Fi gets reconnected, the client will probably continue backing up the data. They don't really care. Like, they expect that connectivity issues will happen. There's just fact of life. And so we need to ensure that whenever we are migrating the data, that we are able to interpret the data correctly and are able to migrate it correctly. And now also battery connectivity, right? Like, usually I charge my phone overnight, and then um, I hope that Wi-Fi is still there. And so uh, backup will start, but maybe I forgot to plug in my phone or got disconnected. And so that means that when the phone dies, it will have backed up, again, partial data. And so next time my phone uh, gets plugged in and gets charged, that's when the client will figure out how they're going to back up the rest of the data. And we need to be able to be resilient to those failures. Now, on the architectural side, we need to prove the stack. And so we used a lot of probers for that, where we basically compare it querying the old data storage and the new data storage, and comparing what would have been returned. Is the data that we stored sufficient to be able to return exact same output to our user? Or did we miss something because we misunderstood the client, and so we need to now add it and backfill it? And so probing the stack also allows us to compare the latencies and compare the error rates and ensure that we're able to reach the backends when we need them. And um, so the important consideration here is, is the response from the new system the same, uh, response from the new system same as from the old? Does the data look the same to the user? Because the end goal of the zero downtown migrations is that there's no user visible impact. There is no changes as far as the user is concerned about getting the data out. So now, um, another thing about migrating from old to new data storage is we need to learn the new data storage. For our migration, it ended up being uh, migrating from another data storage we had to Spanner, which means understanding the operational aspects of Spanner, understanding the schema that we store in Spanner. But it could just be same data storage. You just change the schema. And now change a lot of things about how you reason about the data, how it's stored. And so uh, important consideration here is to think through whether it's completely a new storage mechanism. And so now you need to understand the details of it, maybe how the transactions work and how they impact the user and state. And um, also maybe if there's a new schema. And so that would change how data is represented. And you will need to consider to ensure that it's representative and not, uh, sufficiently expressive and representative. On the architectural side, well, now we need to harden the system. So we need to figure out what it is that we're missing to make the system production ready. And so there's a lot of thought involved with getting it to production readiness to be able to serve the full load. So do we have sufficient monitoring? Can we actually see when issues are happening? Can we see that everything is fine and we, can we monitor that? Can we measure the latencies? Can, do we have sufficient alerting set up so that we can be woken up when something is wrong, but also we don't get woken up so frequently that we start ignoring the pages? And so there's a lot of thought going into how to ensure that the system is sufficiently ready to start serving authoritative load. And now important consideration is migrating slowly. From 1% of users migrated to 50% of users migrated, there will be different storage requirements, of course. And um, so understanding the resource constraints, that's the middle line. Um, do we have enough resources? Have we acquired them enough? Um, we need to validate, validate, and validate. This means that 
the, the more the validation, the better, because that means that the chances of some bug, tricky bug coming through the system is going to be very slim, and so that means that the migration will be most successful. And so this means validating at the very storage layer. If you can, compare just the bytes that you've written, maybe comparing those. Comparing the intermediate representation, so going one layer up, and ensuring that whatever you're going to write, if you can share intermediate representation to have be the same object, the same type, whatever, uh, making sure that those look the same. And then from the uh, serving stack, ensuring that the serving stack will have served the same data, and so on. Um, and uh, finally, scaling migration. So we want the migration to go quickly. It's expensive to run the migrations. And so once we are confident enough in our system, we want to make sure that we just wrap it up and so we can move our users to the new system, give them all the benefits of being on the new system without any of the downsides. And so at that point, we would want to make sure that we, um, if we have pipelines, migration pipelines, that we scale them up and are able to run them as fast as we can to copy all the data, move the, all the data out, and verify all the data so we could keep moving faster and faster. An important uh, consideration is also scaling factors um, when acquiring uh, resources and comparing the resources. The resource utilization may not be linear from a small percentage of users to higher percentage of users. Um, there's a lot of things involved with scaling factors such as encoding, compression, uh, replication, read and write amplification. And when you're moving from different storage mechanisms or just different schema representations, these might all be important considerations for you to have. And you would want to be projecting and doing some capacity planning to ensure that you actually understand how to um, process forward so that you have enough data to store it in the new system. You have enough resources to store the new data. And now finally, from the architecture side as well, we want to make sure that we're rolling out slowly. 10% of the data uh, might be the breaking point for us. So at the beginning, maybe we start rolling out, and we rolled out, say, 1% of the users, and it's fine, it didn't take us that long, and we discovered a bug. We could just toss away the old database, uh, the, the, or the newly acquired data, because we just discovered a bug, fixed it, and now we can throw it all away and start all over. But when we get to, say, 10% of users migrated, that's a lot of resources already used, and that would be a lot of wasted effort and time, and so we want to make sure that we do this very slow so we catch bugs as early as possible so that we're able to proceed then later on much faster. An important consideration here is to be able to scale carefully to make sure that we always anticipate the next a percentage of users that will be added to it, ensuring that they have all the necessary resources, um, such as CPU to serve their request and the RAM, and um, in scaling it proactively. And uh, as I mentioned, the resource utilization might not scale linearly, and so we'll want to do some load testing. We want to compare what it looks like. Maybe a 10% of um, users migrated will use some amount of uh, resources, but then at 50%, it won't be five times as many resources required because it's possible that our caching behavior becomes better and so we're able to utilize caches better and so on. So this is a lot of thought going into and measuring and to ensure that we understand it. So now for the takeaways, and this is just for general migrations based on my experience doing multiple zero downtime migrations that all have proceeded successfully. So first of all, focus on intermediate state. As it happens, we usually understand pretty well what the old system looked like, because we've been running and maintaining it, operating it, and so we have pretty good understanding of what it does, then, unless we inherited it, which also happens. And now, um, the new system, we just designed it, we just discussed it with our peers, we just uh, figured out a best way to represent the data and best way to scale it, and so we understand it also pretty well. What we haven't spent any time understanding yet is um, what are the intermediate states? What are the, all the states that are partial rollouts of the new system, and how do they interact when some of the old system is still up and some of the new system is still up, and you want to utilize both? What does that look like? And so dedicating the rest of the resources and time and thought into understanding all the different partial states, all the intermediate states is very important and prepare to write a lot of intermediate co uh, code, a lot of code that would be there just for maybe a month, a couple months, however long your migration lasts. 
uh, just to support those you know, little bridges in between different partial states. And the quality of code should correspond to the expected lifetime. So if you intend on leaving some migration code there forever because you're still going to keep your old data, uh, data storage because it's expensive to migrate all the data into new data storage, that's fine. So maybe invest time into making sure it's maintainable and readable. If you're gonna throw away this code as soon as you run the script that you just wrote, you know, maybe you don't need to worry so much about um, ensuring that it's well maintainable test it first, of course, but uh, it doesn't probably need to make sense to the rest of your team the same way as long as you're going to be the one, only one owning it. So just making those trade-offs uh, and thinking it through them. Another important thing to consider is migrating backends first. Generally, the migrations that I've worked with were all about hitting scalability limitations and then ensuring that the new system that we bring up is scalable enough to support the anticipated growth and the current usage. And so going back to the example of the distributed build system, build rabbit, all of the purple boxes were the backends. And so we wanted to make sure that we first scale them up, we can prove that they can scale up to our needs. And only then did we worry about, we actually had a very thick client library, only then did once we proved that they can scale up, did we worry about changing anything on the front end. Then finally, invest into observability of your system. You want to know at every single point in time during migration, after and after, how your system is doing. Can you tell whether it's having issues? Can you tell whether it's having corruptions? Um, export the counters. We did a lot of very fine counters manually at the beginning of the migration process to ensure that we actually trust what we're doing. Now, something that we've discussed just recently about going slowly with your rollout and doing it incrementally. So important thing to consider here is that uh, you want to affect as few users as possible as early on as possible, right? You want to discover bugs early on before you have done the whole migration. And you want to make sure that it's only a few users. So something that um, I've done for one of the migrations is we had a trusted user that was able to work with us a lot closer to allow us to iterate and find out those issues. And they had some capacity on their end to help us debug those things from different angles. And uh, so validate scalability while affecting fewer users. That's how you make sure that your migration goes smoothly and Many people are not upset about something weird happening. And also, decouple launches of services. So in this um, build rabbit, the distributed build system example, each of these services um, were owned by independent sub-teams. And so any of those, every single one of these services was actually quite complicated and quite, um, it, it was a complex system. And so, we wanted to make sure that we don't wait to route any one of those particular blocks before um, every, we want to make sure we can roll out every single one of those blocks without being blocked on any one of those components being ready. And this is to ensure that uh, if one of the components hits roadblocks, maybe it's with user uh, adoption or anything, we can still proceed with the migration and get as many benefits to our users with the new system as soon as possible. So now, um, it's very important that you validate your rollout. So validate at all the different um, layers of abstraction, making sure that you trust what the system is doing, you trust the migration processes, you trust your own understanding of what the clients will be doing with the data. And practice the rollouts. Something that we did for the, uh, something that I did for the distributed build system rollout is, so we had a client that talked to the scheduler, and then we had, um, and then it would it find out which worker should talk to, and then it would send the request to the worker and then hear back from the worker. So now when we started retiring the scheduler, uh, we would stop sending the request to the scheduler itself and start sending the request to the persistent queue. And then once the scheduler has responded to us with all the requests that we had in flight, we stop talking to it all together. And so now we send all the new work to the persistent queue, now, at some point, the worker will, uh, will still be sending the work to the worker because the scheduler has told us just recently which workers to talk to. But at some point, those requests will complete and we'll continue, uh, we'll finish up getting the responses directly from the worker to the uh, user. And then once the build rabbit worker completes the workloads, the in-flight request that it had, it will start dequeuing once it has the capacity off of the queue. 
And so getting this order right was actually non-trivial and made several mistakes before when trying it out. And it required coordination across several teams to ensure that we're doing the right thing correctly, that our alerts and pagers understand what we're doing and we can step in and explain to the system, the alerting system what's going on and, um, and understand all the impact. And we actually got it wrong several times before we got it right. And it helped to practice it out on some small, very small fraction of requests to be able to get this right before we did it massively. And so now then the worker would talk to the client and give the data as we saw from the build artifacts and the thing, but not picture here. Okay, so these are, I would recommend these three takeaways for when you're starting on your zero downtime migrations and considering how to approach it. And I would like to thank my team uh, and the approvers who enabled me to be able to share this knowledge with you. And this is all for today. Thank you.